petunias that have been planted. And uh, I was not asked to do this. I know you thought that I was the one who planted all of those flowers around, but I want you to know that it was the junior high and the high school people under the supervision of Randy Price. And uh, with you, I want to express my appreciation to them for making the chapel's properties more beautiful. We're grateful to them and thankful to Randy and the leadership that he has given to them. Whenever I hear the term limited atonement, I must confess I do not like it. The reason I do not like it is twofold. In the first place, everyone limits the atonement. Calvinists limit the design of the atonement. They say that God came to perform a particular work designed for a particular people. Arminians say that he came in order to save everyone, but that he has failed in his intent because of our disobedience. So Arminian atonement is a limited atonement as well as Calvinistic theory, uh, atonement is a limited atonement. And so it's false to call one of these limited and the other unlimited, unless we all say, so also say unlimited and frustratable. And I don't think that anyone who is a Christian man would like to think of his God as a frustratable deity. But what further disturbs me about that term is the fact that we are told that the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ is so broad, so significant, so effective, that there will be in heaven a number of people that cannot be numbered. In fact, Scripture says, the great multitude which no man can number out of every people, tribe, kindred, tongue, and nation. Now that sounds most generous on the part of a God who did not have to save anyone after the fall in the Garden of Eden. So if you'll pardon me, I do not like that term. I think it's false. I think it's false to a particular view and consequently I think of the atonement that the Lord Jesus has accomplished as broad, sufficient for all, and glorious in the glorifying of our triune God in heaven. Sometimes uh, even I get stirred up at my old age. Now today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 through verse 5. I must confess that I had uh, intended to start a series on uh, the way in which evangelicalism has begun to move away from historic orthodoxy in recent years, but, and I still intend to do that, but I would like to do just a little bit more preparation for it. So today I'm turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 5. And we're looking at something that is right at the foundation of the faith that we have. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 5. I'm reading from the authorized version. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. May the Lord bless this reading from his word. There's one thing that I failed to say, which I intended to say. I'm sure that Dr. Daniel will make the point that I made very plain in his next two studies. Let's bow together 
in a moment of prayer. Father, we are grateful to thee and thankful for the word of God and for the gospel which has been conveyed to us by faithful men, prophets, apostles, and others through the centuries. We thank thee for the fact that we have within our hands the scriptures which so remarkably and so wonderfully detail the redemption that the Lord Jesus has accomplished for sinners. And we thank thee for the ministry of the triune God to us, the Father in his work of divine election, the Son in his work of divine redemption, and the Spirit in his work of the divine application of that redemption to a special people, the people of God. We thank thee and praise thee. We could never, Lord, express to thee the gratitude of our hearts that thou hast included us in the plan of the ages. And Father, we ask that by thy grace, through the preaching of the word of God, that all of the people of God may be gathered together as sheep into the flock of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that the gospel may go forth and may go forth to as many as thou dost de deem it desirable and useful. And may the Holy Spirit continue to work in the hearts of men and to draw them to Christ. We thank thee, Lord, for the other blessings that are ours through the redemption that is ours. We thank thee for this country of which we are a part. We pray thy blessing upon our president and others in our government. We pray that we may be responsive to them and that they may be responsive to thee. We ask thy blessing upon the whole church of Jesus Christ and thank thee for each individual member, each individual who has by thy grace been brought to rest his destiny for time and eternity upon the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless, Lord, bring to maturity each one of the saints to glorify thy name. We pray for the sick. We ask thy blessing upon them, and especially for those who have requested our petitions and prayers, we pray for them. Give healing as it pleases thee, Lord, and we pray that thou wilt minister to them through the physicians and through their friends and family. May thy name be honored in the experiences of life, and we pray for some who are bereaved, particularly we commit them to thee. We pray that thou wilt give encouragement and consolation to them and strengthen them as they pass through some of the difficult, most difficult experiences of human life. Be with us this day. May the meetings in Believer's Chapel honor thy name. May our hearts, all of us, from our little children through to the adults, may our hearts be open to the Holy Scriptures. For Jesus' sake, amen. <coughs> The subject for today as we turn to the ministry of the Word of God is the point of reference, the cross. It's necessary from time to time to return to the basics. In authentic Christianity, it's the cross of Christ. It's the foundation. It's the criterion of faith. The sheer oddness of the fact that the cross is the criterion of faith is remarkable because it must have seemed to the early church and to many who heard them preach that the cross was something of a disaster so far as the preaching of it was concerned because the early church had to face the taunt of the early opponents of the Christian faith who believed that true believers worshipped an evil man and his cross, homo noxius et crux eius. The very fact that Christians worshipped a man who had been crucified was sufficient to utterly discredit their belief in the eyes 
of those who were the opponents of Christianity. The fact that their ceremonies centered on a man who was put to death for his crime on the deadly wood of Calvary's cross was, as one of them had put it, to assign these abandoned wretches sanctuaries which are appropriate to them and the kind of worship which they deserved. Abandoned wretches, sounds like Ted Turner saying that all Christians are losers. I can imagine that the early church had serious problems preaching the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ if they didn't fully understand it. There is uh, a second century graffito depicting a figure with the head of an ass being crucified with a second figure standing alongside with an armed raise. And the slogan accompanying this graffito is Alexam Alexaminos worships his God. In other words, to worship an individual being crucified with the head of an ass. That's the way the world thought of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the second century, when Justin Martyr wrote, he recorded the offense caused by the sophisticated citizens, caused to the sophisticated citizens of Alexandria and elsewhere by, quote, the madness, unquote, of the Christian proclamation of the crucified Christ. The proclamation of the word of the cross was re recognized as scandalous, offensive, deeply disturbing to those who heard it because it represented a demand that they worship and adore a man executed in the most unseemly manner. Yet for the apostles, the ancient tree was the point of reference. Listen to what Paul says. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. If you turn over to the epistle to the Galatians, in chapter 3, as Paul talks about his ministry to them, he says much the same thing. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth or openly set forth crucified among you. In other words, the apostle not only preached that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that is that he in his identity was that promised one, but he preached him, so the text says in both places, as crucified. He preached him as a crucified Messiah, not simply as a Messiah, but as a crucified Messiah. Luther said, the cross alone is our theology. Luther understood this great fact, and because he understood it, we are the inheritors of the Protestant Reformation. In fact, what Paul states here, I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, is reflected almost universally in the Christian church. For example, let's take the Lord's Supper, the second of the ordinances that we have been commanded to observe by the Lord Jesus Christ. How is the Lord's Supper known in the Christian church? Well, it's known as the Holy Communion in some communions. It's known as the Eucharist in other communions. Eucharist meaning thanksgiving, a term that Paul uses to express the Lord's Supper. It's the time of thanksgiving. The Eucharistia is the Greek term, but you, the Eucharist. And in the Roman Catholic Church, it's known as the Mass. So here we have the Mass, the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, and frequently in Believer's Chapel, you will find individuals referring to it as the Lord's Supper. In other words, there's universal agreement in the Christian Church that this central form of worship, at the very least, commemorates, reenacts, and recalls to memory the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the benefits that are understood to bring to those who believe in him. Christians do not re revere the Lord Jesus Christ as a kind of dead rabbi. They think of him as one who was crucified 
and crucified for our sins and now risen, and we worship him as a present, living, risen Lord who was crucified for us. And the very fact that this is universally the view of the Christian church indicates that God in his sovereign providence has preserved that fact to illustrate that the central message of the Christian faith, the authentic message, is a Messiah who has been crucified for men's sins. That's why it's the point of reference. It's the point of reference of the Christian church, the cross. And we observe the Lord's Supper, we remember that. If you observe the Eucharist or the Holy Communion or even the Mass, you are in effect saying the same thing. This is the heart of the Christian faith. There is no such Christian faith, true Christian faith, that does not have this at its heart. So when the apostle wrote the Corinthians, he was just stating what was the most powerful kind of statement that could be made about Jesus Christ. Perhaps he wrote it to con combat a form of triumphalism of wisdom. That is the kind of wisdom that prevailed in the times of the early church in which people said, we have certain wisdom, it has been given to the enlightened, you may have it, and through the enlightened wisdom that we know, such as the Gnostics claimed, you may have the true knowledge of God. It may be that the apostle centered his message uh, with that as his enemy, but nevertheless, what he states is true. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I'd like to look first at the message that the apostle proclaims, and here it's found in verses 1 and 2. The Christian gospel, the apostle states, is not worldly wisdom. It's not grounded in man's fallen reason. How important that is for Christians to realize. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. In consistency with the principles of God's authoritative word, now I say word, I put that in quotes in my notes because if you look back at chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, for the word of the cross, translated preaching in the authorized version, but the word lagos, for the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are being saved, it's the power of God. So in consistency with the principles of God's authoritative word, Rhetoric, philosophy, whether Platonism, Aristotelianism, Hegelianism, or all of the other kinds of isms that philosophers have invented down through the centuries, or psychology such as William James, or Freud, or Gestalt, or any of the other kinds of psychology that men have toyed with, these things, the apostle says, are not his teachers, not his mentors. I came not unto you with excellency of speech or of wisdom in declaring to you the testimony of God. And what is so interesting now is that finally, in the 20th century, in 1990, even our scholars are beginning to realize that there is no such thing as scholarly neutrality reading a most recent book by a well-known scholar from the University of Oxford. In several places in the book, he comments upon the fact that, quote, scholarly neutrality has now finally become discredited. Everybody speaks from a viewpoint. Everybody speaks from a faith. And the apostle says, very frankly, my faith is not grounded in excellency of speech. It's not grounded in excellency of wisdom. It's grounded in the word of the cross. Christ's pulpit and the apostle's pulpit is the cross of the Lord Jesus. Now he says, I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't know whether you realize or not, but this was a blatant contradiction in the day in which Paul wrote this. A Messiah crucified, 
That's a contradiction in terms. For the Messiah was to come as a victorious Messiah and was to overcome the Gentile world and restore the kingdom of God to the Jewish people. The idea of a crucified Messiah then is a contradiction in terms. If you have a Messiah, you do not have a crucifixion. If you have a crucifixion, you do not have a Messiah. Someone has said it's a sort of an oxymoron. That is a statement with a sharpness about it, but nevertheless which expresses something that is fundamental true. It's not so much the person as the office that the apostle has in mind here when he says Christ crucified, the Messiah crucified, but nevertheless it's a contradiction. An illustration of the difficulty that the Jews had in this fact was that while the Christians, when they wrote in the early centuries, when they wrote to Jews, sought to explain this. On the other hand, when it became evident as the Christians pointed to the Old Testament that the Old Testament did say that the Messiah would suffer. You remember the Lord Jesus on the Emmaus Road had to instruct the apostles on that point and said, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered and to enter into his glory? So the early Christians sought to explain from scriptures and finally the Jewish people realized it was in scripture that the Messiah would suffer and so they had to invent something in order to meet it. And so they invented the doctrine of two Messiahs. Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben David, or Messiah the son of Joseph, Messiah the son of David. Messiah the son of Joseph would suffer and die. Messiah the son of David would be the magnificent, glorious, reigning Messiah. And you can look at Jewish literature and Christian controversy and discover that that theory was never advanced until long after the Christian era had begun. So, the idea of worshiping, actually worshiping a dead man, Celsus said, was something that offended many people in the early times because they did not fully understand. Why? Why a crucified Messiah, someone might ask. We do know that there is wisdom in this. There is a wisdom of the cross, and it's expressed in this. I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. What's the wisdom about this? Well, let me suggest three things. First of all, the crucified Christ, Messiah as it were crucified, is a word about us. Fundamentally, it's a word about ourselves. The cross is no symbol of gentleness. We may wreathe the cross with roses and make it look sweet, but it's not sweet. They realized it was not sweet. It tells a story about you and about me. It says that we are born to die. It says we are sinners. It says we deserve the judgment of God. And look, my Christian friend and my non-Christian friend, look at your life. You are born to die. Why are you born to die? You are born to die because of what happened in the Garden of Eden and what you have inherited for that reason. Friday morning, I conducted a funeral and placed in the head, the service that would result in the placing of a body of a Christian man in the grave, born to die. Very effective life, very fulfilling life in many ways, but a life born to die. You are born to die. The cross is a word about us. We are in the image of God, God's greatest creation, but we are born to die. And so amidst the wreckage of our self-esteem, we learn our sin, our guilt, our lostness, our perishing. As the Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 in verse 22 and 23, and stated these words, Ye men of Israel, 
Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified him and have slain him. We are born to die because we're sinners. Every one of us, the little children in this auditorium, the little children that are not here, your little children, your little grandchildren, born to die. How thankful we should be that there is an apostle who says, I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, for that's the great remedy. That's the point of reference of the Christian faith. That's that which answers the questions that thinking spiritual men have. So first of all, our debt's infinite. The Son of God must die. Not a prophet, not an apostle. The Son of God must die. The eternal, infinite, second person of the Trinity must die for you and for me. I'm so thankful for a crucified Messiah. But secondly, it says a word about the world. I look back in verse 23, and Paul wrote, but we preach Christ as crucified, or a, or a crucified Messiah, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. This is a word about the world, as well as about me. The world's wisdom saw him dying, helplessly, pointlessly, abandoned, that's the opinion they had. That's why they thought it was such a shame and such an offense to them to worship someone who had been hanging upon a cross as a, executed as a criminal. But if, what does it say about the world? It says the world does not know him. The apostles say that more than once, you know. The world does not know him. And because it did not know him, it does not know you. So the New Testament states over and over again. It does not know us because it did not know him. The Jews looked and they considered this Christ crucified a stumbling block. The Gentiles considered it foolishness. They made no sense out of it whatsoever. You at least could say it was a stumbling block to the Jews because they expected a Messiah. But for the Gentiles, it was just foolishness. But God contradicted the judgment of the world. The world said, let him die. He deserves to die. He's a common criminal. But God contradicted the judgment. And on the first day of the week, he rose again from the dead. The world looks at our Lord Jesus from the standpoint of Good Friday. Except they wouldn't say Good Friday. They look, at, they look at him from the standpoint of Friday, the day of the crucifixion. We look at him from the standpoint of Easter day. We know that God contradicts the world's judgment, raises the Son of God from the grave, and we have a Savior at the right hand of the throne of God, a Messiah who has been crucified, authentic Christianity, but one who lives and saves at this very moment. And then finally, it's a word regarding our God. It tells us of divine grace in salvation. It tells us what Paul says in verse 18 of chapter 1, for the preaching or word of the cross is to them that are perishing. Incidentally, that's in the present tense. In the original text, we could render it to get the point. The word of the cross is to them that are perishing born to die, you see, foolishness, but unto us who are being saved, we're not completely saved yet, but are being saved, it's the power of God. Divine grace in salvation. Look at the 30th verse, but of him, not of ourselves, of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has been made unto us wisdom, the wisdom of righteousness or justification and sanctification and redemption. This 
is a word about our God and what he has done by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we have true self-esteem, self-esteem genuinely grounded in the eternal love of our Father in heaven. I must confess, I do not know any self-esteem that is worth that except the self-esteem of the knowledge that I belong to an eternal God who has loved me in Christ. And what a self-esteem that is. That is the kind of self-esteem, not because I'm anything other than the object of the Father's love, which takes us through all the experiences of life. Eternal love, eternal love centered upon me, nothing in me. Do you know why there is nothing in me that provoked eternal love? Because God's an eternal God. His love is everlasting love. Long before I was ever born, he loved. I didn't have anything to do with that. He loved before I was born. Like Jacob, in upon whom God put his love. As he looked and saw Jacob and Esau before, Paul says, they had done anything good or bad, God had set his love upon Jacob. Just like it if you like. This is our eternal God. I'm the object of eternal love. God loved me before I was born. I had nothing to do with his love. I'm the object of his love. It's unchangeable because he's unchangeable. And the fact that he loved me then means he loves me now. He will love me on to the end of eternity. And it's invincible love. It conquers everything. And ultimately, I shall be in the presence of the eternal God. Self-esteem. That's true, self-esteem. That fundamentally is the self-esteem that can take me through the experiences of life. The scriptures make this so plain. In Believer's Chapel, why should I have to talk about something like this? You should all say, I know all about that. In Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle writes to the Ephesian believers in the fourth verse, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. His great love wherewith he loved us. And then in the seventh verse, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So he's, re he's revealed himself as the eternal, invincible, loving God. This incidentally, my Christian friend, is the way that God wishes to be known. This is the way he wishes to be known. He's revealed himself in this way. This means specifically he wants to be known in this way. The way of the crucified cross and the word that it speaks to us concerning the Lord God in heaven. The illusion of human reason's competence is utterly destroyed by the message of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us we need to be told what God, the word God means. We have to be told that by the revelation that is found in Holy Scripture. It's one of the things that's given to us by God. Please remember that. It's not something we seek and find. It's something given to us if we sought the true meaning of the term God, we'd never find it of ourselves. Again, Luther was so correct. He said, Scripture is the manger in which Christ is laid. What a magnificent statement. Scripture is the manger in which the Lord Jesus Christ is laid. That's where you find, about him, find out about him. That's where you find out about yourself as well. I don't know whether you've noticed this or not, but if you will look at the Synoptic Gospels, and in fact you could almost include the Gospel of John, although that was written later when other issues had come to the fore. But if you look at the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have you ever noticed the inordinate amount of space 
that the writers of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, gave to the death of Christ? Have you ever noticed that? If you look at the Gospel of Mark, you will find the 33 years passed over with relatively few chapters in comparison with the minute way in which the passion of our Lord is set forth. Just sit down and measure the few days of the passion and the space devoted to it and that devoted to the earlier 33 plus years of our Lord or 30 plus years of our Lord and see proportionately how much has been devoted to the death of our Lord. That will give you some indication of what they regarded as the important thing. And furthermore, if you will look at the apostles' writings and see how little is found concerning the teaching of Christ and how much is found in interpretation of his death and resurrection, it will give you an understanding of what's important from the standpoint of heaven. I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and this one as crucified. Our Gospels, someone has said, Martin Kaler, I believe, the great German theologian, said the Gospels are simply passion narratives. That's perhaps an, ex an example of overemphasis, but nevertheless, there is an element of truth in it. Now, Paul, in verses 3 and 4, and I don't have as much to say about this. If you say, thank the Lord, that's fine. Say it quietly. About verses 3 through 5. But notice the third and fourth verses where Paul talks about his method. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power rejecting the confusing things of human reason, he sought the ultimate testimony. What's the ultimate testimony? The ultimate testimony to the truth of Christianity is the testimony of God. Please remember that. The ultimate testimony to Christianity is the testimony of God. He writes, my speech, my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. What a great comfort to preachers that is. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That word demonstration, incidentally, was a Greek word, apodexis, that referred to the producing of proofs in an argument in court. And in essence, this is what God does in bringing home to us the testimony of the cross and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When true authentication takes place, it's God speaking to us through the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit that this word is the word of God. Which would you rather have? The testimony of a Kant? The testimony of a Hegel? The testimony of a Plato? The testimony of an Aristotle? The testimony of a Wittgenstein? Or... Would you rather have the testimony of God? Well, I'd rather have the testimony of God. He promises us the testimony of God. God speaks through the scriptures and in the scriptures. A Southern theologian that I have learned to admire over the years, James Henley Thornwell once wrote, but in no case is reason the ultimate rule of faith no authority can be higher than the direct testimony of God. No certainty can be greater than that imported, imparted by the Spirit shining on the Word. That's the greatest testimony of all. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, speaking to the hearts of men with the Word of God before us, giving us the sense that the Scriptures are the Word of God. As he said, an accredited revelation like an oath among men, puts an end to all controversy. That's what we have. We have an accredited testimony that the Holy Spirit gives. So Paul says, I was with you in weakness, fear, much trembling. 
My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. In order that, and here his motive is revealed, in order that, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If proof, my friend, is from God, then why magnify the instruments that may bring evidences to us? Ultimately, the proof comes from God as he ministers to us through the word of Scripture. The faith that rests upon philosophical arguments is at the mercy of other arguments of the same nature. A man comes along with a clever argument and we are deeply impressed and so we transfer our trust and trust his clever argument until someone comes along with a cleverer argument and then we must change our views. So anything that depends upon a clever argument is at the mercy of a cleverer argument. But when a person has come by the grace of God to recognize through the Spirit that the Scriptures are the Word of God and they speak to us in a divine way, he's not concerned about clever arguments any longer. This argument is the argument that matters. It is an accredited revelation. This is what Christianity has contended for in its purest form down through the years. So, let me sum up. God wishes to be known in Christ's cross. There he has spoken. He's spoken a word concerning us. He's spoken a word concerning the world. And most wonderfully, he has spoken a word concerning himself, his divine atoning love. The authentic God is truly with us. So, we find in Scripture. He is truly Emmanuel, but he is Emmanuel on the cross at Calvary, God with us. And not only with us there, but also for us. Thus, the necessity of Christ's deity. That's why it's so important to contend for the deity of our Lord. We should never have any understanding of what God was like were it not that the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the eternal trinity, possessed a full deity, came to us and ministered in our midst. How important to recognize it was God upon the cross, God with us, God for us. That's what we proclaim. That's the one in whom we trust. What should be our response? Well, Paul in the preceding chapters talked about response. He says the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Notice the 23rd verse, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. How do we respond to this? Well, look up a few verses and verse 21 says, but for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them who do good works. Join the church, pray through, observe the ordinances, remember his death and burial and resurrection in the ordinances, are educated, are cultured, live in Western society. No, it's just simply, and in fact, it's not even who surrender, but it's believe. Believe. Receive the message. Believe. It's as simple as that. Life is not propagated biologically. The fact that you're a child of believing parents does not mean in one sense at all that you are to have eternal life. You have advantages others don't have. But life is propagated through the supernatural new birth of the Holy Spirit 
who takes of the things of Christ, brings them, brings them home to our heart, and gives us new life as he brings us to faith in him. You know how I love Samuel Rutherford. The problem with Mr. Rutherford is that he lived in the 17th century, 350 years ago, or 300 years ago. Mr. Rutherford has written some very, very precious things. He was about as Calvinistic as you could become. He was a supralapsarian Calvinist. That's of the extreme character. But it's interesting. Arminians read him. Calvinists read him. They enjoy him because of the obvious devotional life that Mr. Rutherford had and the bright mind that he had, for he not only was a pastor in Anwath for a number of years, but also professor of theology at St. Andrews University. He wrote this in one of his communion meditations. I've enjoyed this over the past week so much. He said, of all wonders that ever were read in a printed book, this is the first. Christ made an exchange. Now I'm going to give you the words that he used and I'm going to translate them for you. Christ would cast lives with you. Now that means barter. Christ would barter lives with you. He never beguiled you. Or rather, let me go back. Christ would cast lives with you and make a niffer, an exchange. He never beguiled you, for he took shame and gave you glory. He took the curse and gave you the blessing. He took death and gave you life. The fairest candle that ever was lighted is blown out. The head of the church is dead, and the Lord of life is laid down in the grave. No wonder that the son that did share part of his labors be shut down, because the great son of righteousness was shut down in the grave and a stone laid above him. Good right have ye to Christ. Accept of his niffer, his exchange. Accept of his niffer and change with him and take his best blessings and purchase redemption. May God help us to do that. May God help us to remember the preeminence of Jesus Christ and this one crucified. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, how marvelous it is to reflect upon the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God that is so true to us, that reveals us so plainly and clearly, that reveals the world, and above all, reveals our great loving Father in heaven who loves eternally immutably, invincibly. We thank thee for the blessings of life through Christ. And, oh, Father, if there should be someone in this audience who has not yet fled to thee through the cross in which our Lord died for sinners such as we are, may at this very moment they turn to thee through him, believe the message, rejoice in eternal life. For Jesus' sake, amen.